So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted that Alice Carr, the president and CEO of Capital Impact Partners and the president and CEO of CDC Small Business Finance is joining us today um, to revisit the interview that we did with him in 2018. Welcome, Alice. Thanks, Tim. Good to be with you today. Um, I'd, I'd like to start with you know, really just a general question about the last 16 to 18 months. Um, you know, a lot's happened. Um, global pandemic, um, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd and not just George Floyd, but a, a bunch of other um, killings as well. You know, a reckoning in America that systemic racism is a major challenge for our society, finally. Um, you know, and evidence supporting the urgency to resolve the climate crisis and a lot more. And it's, if you kind of reflect on that of your own experience over the last 18 months, you know, what has it meant for the community development industry as a whole and for your organizations in particular? It's a great question, Tim. And I, I think that uh, to your point, uh, a lot has happened over the last 18 months um, and it's affected us all personally and professionally. Um, I think what it's meant for the community development finance space uh, are a few things. Uh, first, I think as the country has better understood and that I think, the, as you mentioned, there's been a racial reckoning in this country and a, 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 a general awareness of the historical and institutionalized racism that has uh, existed for, for a long time. Uh, it's really kind of pushed uh, the work that CDFIs uh, and other community development organizations have been hard at work at for, for some time to the forefront. When the pandemic happened and uh, the racial reckoning uh, came to a, kind of a climax about a, a year ago, you know, CDFIs have been hard at work kind of working uh, and on their journey uh, for racial equity. And really what that has meant is the same level of awareness, increasing level of awareness um, around how institutionalized and structuralized racism have impacted specifically communities of color. Um, and then a retooling or a pivoting uh, of business strategies to align um, themselves to really ensure that capital is moving in ways to really unlock um, um, the barriers that have existed for so long um, and, and, and which actually has precluded um, CDF or communities from getting the resources that they need. So for us, that has been actually pivoting from uh, a sector-based national strategy to really focusing on a place-based strategy where we choose to go deep and bring all of our resources to bear to a place. It's also meant um, that we have really thought about and entered the community in a very different way. So it's really affected the what we did and how we did it. Um, and so we have really kind of pivoted, again, from a, a sector, national sector-based strategy to a place-based orientation and entering the community by first listening and then developing products and services um, to respond to what we believe the community needs are. And so that was a fundamental shift for us in a lot of different ways. Uh, and then the third thing I'd say that that was really a, a change for us was after kind of doing uh, and starting our racial equity journey and, and learning more as an organization and developing products and services that align with the community. We've also really kind of focused our efforts on really the root causes, uh, not the symptoms, but the root causes of the issues that we believe that preclude capital from flowing into communities fundamentally changed the way that we've gone and done work um, and happy to say that we've kind of made the realization prior to the pandemic and prior to last year, but it's actually put, again, the work that CDFIs and uh, like Capital Impact and others um, at the forefront of this work. So I, I'm particularly interested in the last point, which is that it's changed um, you know, the products and services that you'd offer. Could you, you say a little bit more about that and then how you're actually addressing the root causes of the systemic issues that the communities are dealing with? 
Sure. Um, you know, it's changed the, the way that we've gone about developing products and services because we've been much more intentional about them. Rather than just thinking about how do we affect poverty writ large and how do we think about poverty alleviation, we've said, well, what are the main drivers of poverty? And particularly in the communities in which we're, which we're serving, which oftentimes are majority minority. And so as we've really taken a step back um, to think through that and evaluate the different geographies that we're in while we're, and also um, kind of deeply engage in the community, you know, we have utilized that knowledge to begin to develop products and services that look different, right? That values the assets in the community differently because part of the, the challenge, and I think we can all understand why the, the credit system works the way it does. It works quite well for many people, but it doesn't work well for everyone. And so for the folks who are excluded from mainstream finance and financial services, we had to think about ways to really encourage um, participation and develop products and services to really get that, uh, get folks more folks to participate. So we've done a few things. One, we've thought about how do we develop capacity building efforts that really create networks, um, that create connections and knowledge so that capital can be consumed um, in the right ways. And we develop products that really kind of taken a different perspective on underwriting um, and gone away from the traditional underwriting that many organizations use that require skin in the game of 10 to 20% and really think about um, given the historical uh, inequities that have existed in the market, what are other proxies for skin in the game? So those are just a few examples of how we've gone about it. Um, differently, exam specific examples are uh, the equitable development initiative we did um, that's really focused on really helping to grow the pipeline of minority developers. We've developed uh, not only the technical assistance and training, which is a 16 week program, but we've also developed capital loan funds both in Detroit and DC to really help provide uh, specific support to developers in this case. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I saw the announcement around the, the DC fund. So congratulations on that as well. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we've seen in terms of the, the reckoning is that corporates have been uh, quick perhaps um, to step up with commitments. Um, and I think that the, the running tally is in the vicinity of $68 billion um, to systemically help back communities or businesses. Um, and uh, I want, and you know, yet my understanding is, is that really so far, the amount that's been deployed is a fraction of that. Um, you know, are you concerned that this is something that can be sustained? And what is your view in general about what you think the major corporates, not, not just corporations themselves, like um, you know, some of the largest Fortune 100 companies, um, but also the financial institutions could be doing um, to help transform the communities that, that you work in? That's a great question, Tim. I, I think uh, I, I'll start by saying I am concerned that this is a moment, a fleeting moment at that. Um, because quite frankly, it's, it could be perceived as politically incorrect to stay silent. And there, as you mentioned, there have been a tremendous amount of commitments made. Um, and my concern is that those commitments um, have been made in some cases in good spirit, but the, um, but the intentionality and the expectation is that doing more of the same that has always been done, which is actually not going to address the problem. And as we talked about before, it, it's a Band-Aid, but, it, um, but if we really wanna fix the deep intract intractable problems that we have, we really have to look at the root causes. And so my hope would be that corporate corporates would really think differently about how they uh, are making their commitments, where they're making their commitments, and actually taking um, some, being courageous uh, around thinking differently about how to shift the paradigm to really help um, support more people coming into the financial mainstream. 
And quite frankly, when you think about it, um, it's just a good business practice. The literally the face of the nation is changing, right? Where um, this country will be majority minority by 2050. And so these are future customers, um, future partners and future employees. And so I think it just makes really good business sense uh, for uh, corpus to really invest um, uh, in this sector of the market. I, I, I certainly share that perspective and it's, um, I, I, I too hope that it's not fleeting and I hope that it becomes a core part of the activities of, of the corporations, for example, their treasury operations, but why shouldn't they be placing money, um, you know, into housing funds or whatever else it happens to be that are focused on, on, on the communities that, that we're all working in. Um, I, I, I want to change the subject a little bit. I mean, your title's a little different than it was um, when we spoke a couple of years ago. And I know that one of the things that you spoke about in that interview, um, you know, was your desire to, um, you know, see more capital flow um, into the communities themselves um, from the traditional sources, um, but also, um, you know, that you thought that there was opportunity for organizations perhaps to come together um, or to think differently about how they operate. So, can you tell us a little bit about the journey that you've been on over the last couple of years? I'm really interested that I said all of that the last time we talked. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we've been we've been busy for over over two years, um, and we're excited to announce that we recently finalized a combination with CDC Small Business Finance, which is the uh, nation's largest uh, mission-based SBA lender in the country. Uh, and we came together, quite frankly, to do something that we couldn't do individually, we couldn't achieve individually, to transform how capital and investments um, flow into underestimated communities. And so, you know, coming together, our goal is really to, to create a tech-enabled financial services organization that stands with communities, making sure that agency stays in communities, and provide holistic solutions that support wealth creation, uh, that creates jobs, quality affordable housing and essential services that quite frankly, every community needs. So we've been um, spending the last 24 plus months bringing the two organizations together and um, combined over the last, since our inception, uh, we've invested over $24 billion in communities across the country. And we believe that it's that type of scale that will get um, institutional investors like the corporates we talked about and others really interested in investing through organizations like ours as an asset class. And we felt as though coming together will provide the scale and the investable opportunities for a variety of uh, investors to really support our work. And what are the challenges being on doing being in doing that? I mean, first of all, congratulations. That's that's wonderful. It's rare to see two large institutions come together like that. We see it often in the in the for profit sector. Um, you know, usually stated as a takeover. Um, I think that you know you frame that this is a, a combination, a coming together, and of complementary skill sets, and must have been tough. Um, to have started something pre-pandemic and then had to work a lot of the detail out. So can you give those who are listening to us um, a little bit of um, a peek um, under the covers as to, as to what the challenges were and, and what surprised you in a, in a good way about, about that process? Sure. And just going back to the, one of the, your prior questions uh, around uh, our pivot and, and remember that we went from a sector-based uh, national lender to a community-focused, um, in-place, uh, place-based-oriented or organization. And one of the things we found out by listening to the community is that we needed to create, provide more wealth-building opportunities. Um, we were currently focused in housing and community facilities, and quite frankly, um, those things were are, and are essential to, to every community. But again, as we think about developing, you know, addressing root causes, increasing the flow of capital around ownership was something that was really important to us. And so that was one of the main reasons that this was really um, interesting to us from a capital impact perspective. 
So we embedded, we embarked on a journey uh, with CDC Small Business Finance, and that process really um, was interesting. Um, you know, initially it started out with conversations around who we were and what we were about, and um, a large part of the conversation before we even got to board discussions and due diligence was all around culture. It was all around the how. Um, what were our values and how do we live out our values through, the, through our work? And I think over time, uh, initially when Kurt and I began, began to have these conversations, we saw that there were some synergies with the, the how um, we went about our work and the values by which um, uh, our employees came to work every day and what they espoused to um, every day with each other and with our customers. And that process uh, uh, looked like a, a number of kind of zigzags across the country. If you, if you were to look at our map, because we're uh, capital in fact is on the East Coast, uh, CDC Small Business Finance is on the West Coast. So a lot of um, uh, travel back and forth across country and meeting in the middle at some point and sometimes. Uh, and that was all prior to, to the pandemic. Um, and then the pandemic happened. So we went, uh, we had to go virtual. And so a lot of the conversations that we had, the due diligence um, process, the, the meetings with the board. And I think in all told, I probably had about 40 board meetings over the course of 2019 or 2020 and 2019. Um, and uh, it ended up in a really good place. But, you know, peaking, you know, I'd say at, the, at a high level, it was around, initial interactions between the CEOs and a small team uh, with Next Street, of course. Uh, and then over time, it began to layer in more and more of the executive management teams of both organizations. Um, and then with the boards, um, a lot of individual conversations with the boards uh, around proving the case around why coming together really made sense for each one of us uh, independently. And then as we began, uh, as we were the boards were convinced that this was a great opportunity, we began to have more joint conversations uh, across boards uh, until we got effectively to closing. But I think it's, it was a great process to, to really validate some of the earlier assumptions that we had. Uh, it was a, a doubling down on the things that really mattered the most, which was around orienting our work around with a racial equity lens and going deep in place um, and really partnering with communities and partnering with other community-based organizations, recognizing that a holistic approach is really required to be able to support communities in the way that, that they deserve. So, I mean, one of the things that, that we talked about last time as well was, was talent and the attraction of talent. I mean, have you noticed as a result of what's happened in the last year or so, and also as a result of your announcement of the combination of the two organizations that 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 talent is is really looking to come um, to work um, in in an environment and in firms and organizations um, that have mission and purpose at the, the core of what they do. Absolutely, um, I think given the the pandemic and the last eighteen months and time has really kind of made CDFI as a more household name than they've ever been before. Um, and as a result of that awareness, um, CDFIs and, um, and folks who are looking to move into a, a position filled with purpose has really precipitated, in my mind, a, a significant shift in terms of um, talent acquisition for CDFIs at large. Um, we began to see that um, as the pandemic drew on. And I think people had opportunities to kind of reevaluate uh, their lives and what, what was really important to them and how they could utilize their, their time and their talent for good beyond just some, some volunteer uh, position. And um, we've also seen quite an uptick um, for the Alliance and the work of the Alliance uh, as we've come together with CDC Small Business Finance um, because the work that we are um, trying to do or attempting to do and the vision that we have for the organization um, and getting to scale specifically, I think resonates 
with um, a much wider audience. That coupled with the fact that we want to grow and expand leveraging technology as well. Talk a little bit more about the technology piece. I mean, you've said it a couple of times in this conversation. Um, you know, why do you think that that's important and what do you think needs to happen? So I think in any time um, there is a drastic change in environment, and we can call the last 18 months a drastic change in the environment, it's usually a time when truly innovative sectors or companies innovate. And I think this is really an opportunity for us to think differently about the work that we do, particularly because we know that underestimated communities in particular have been overlooked for some time and the pandemic has, has really uh, had a, an adverse effect on communities across the country. So not only did we have work, a lot of work to do before, I think we've taken three steps back given, the, given where we are with the pandemic and the social unrest. And so we need to think differently about how we can accelerate our impact and, our, uh, and utilize our dollars more effectively uh, for communities that desperately need it today. The last six months has really been transformative in terms of the amount of resources that uh, are looking to be placed in the CDFI sector. It gives us a chance to really think about our operations and our approach um, to the communities in which we're working in. And mind you, um, the baby boomer generation, a lot, uh, a lot of the baby boomers are retiring. And when you think about the next several generations, many of them uh, don't go anywhere without this. And so in terms of how do we think about engaging the community, we need to think very differently about that. And the fact that we're lending and investing in these communities, uh, we need to think about how technology can enable us to do it faster and more efficiently and effectively. And meet, meeting people where they are, even if that means meeting them where they are through, a, through an application or some, some derivation of it. And so uh, the way that we're thinking about it, um, CDC Small Business Finance has a uh, technology company called Ventures Plus. It is a loan origination and management system that currently is utilized by about 250 mission-driven organizations to originate primarily SBA, but also non-SBA or small business uh, products. And our goal uh, is to think about how we can get to scale even broader. And getting to scale in our minds means that uh, we wanna be thoughtful about how we can bring different products to market um, and bringing those products to market in places in which we are in, testing those products within the communities where we have built trust and we're and responding to those communities and then thinking about how we can scale um, that product through the distribution uh, origination uh, platform that we have uh, within Ventures. So that's partially how we're thinking about transforming the market by providing those products to the 250 plus originators who are working and have built trust in their individual markets and doing it in a way that allows uh, the aggregation of those resources and those products to be invested in by the institutions that we talked about earlier. So that leads to two questions for me. So one is around you know, a, a belief that I, I hear you stating, which is that agency in community is really important and that it can take its different, different forms. Um, and one you described was working through other um, uh, entities that are perhaps smaller than, than um, CDC, Small Business Finance and Capital Impact Partners. Um, but talk a little bit more about, about how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, part of this, this last um, 18 months has really kind of also highlighted the, the need for collaboration amongst and across mission-driven organizations. And when you think about uh, the pandemic and the height of pan the pandemic and the need to marshal PPP resources to communities that are in need, specifically communities of color, there were a number of CDFIs, specifically smaller CDFIs that have a very small ge geographic focus. It could be a neighborhood or a few neighborhoods really had earned trust um, and respect in those communities and knew exactly 
where those resources needed to go, but did not have access to those resources. And so I remember having a conversation with one CDFI leader who said, I'm getting calls every day and I wanna be able to help, but I don't have a product and I don't have the capital. And so I think that when we look at um, how we wanna accelerate communities across the country, product and capital are gonna be keys of that. And so thinking about how we can provide technological resources to mission-driven organizations uh, to help them to, have, to, to ensure that they have the right products and technology to uh, underwrite and originate product and manage product over time is incredibly important. Um, it's important because it allows us as organizations to develop a holistic strategy and we have the capital and the products we need to ensure that more people can uh, be a part of mainstream finance. So, so that leads to the, the, the other implied statement that you're making and I want to ask you about because you mentioned the transfer of wealth um, from the, the boomers to the next generations, um, not just the millennials, but a, a broader group of generations. Um, now, do, do you feel that, that, that you know, ex the boomers and even some of the boomers are beginning to think differently about how they want to see their capital, their money um, invested and is trying to help um, with these societal challenges that we have, one of them. I, I absolutely believe that is the case. Um, and we've seen that actually in our own work. Um, several years ago, Capital Impact developed a community investment note uh, that community investment note is um, registered through a registered broker dealer who markets our product. Um, and it's an S&P rated note that's offered on a monthly basis. And we've seen not only uh, several wealth platforms, high net worth wealth platforms uh, with major financial institutions actively market our note and, and distribute it. Um, we've also seen, we've also raised over $200 million from both retail and institutional investors. Um, and the fact that we are always uh, getting is, are we coming out with more? Um, and where, where, what are the stories um, and the impact that we are driving with uh, the proceeds of, that, of, those, of those notes? And so I absolutely believe that we have, um, we are seeing a change and a transfer into a focus that's solely on financial returns to financial and social returns. And I think this is a real opportunity for mission-based organizations to really lean into this moment um, because from my perspective, there is a dearth of uh, products for institutional investors to invest in. And our goal is to not only think about um, the notes as one of those products, but to think about other products that are in the in the format that institutional and broader investors understand that can really help increase the flow of capital to communities. So, so you mentioned that that's really interesting. And you mentioned that um, the notes are on several major institutions platforms. I mean, again, for those who are listening, um, just, just give us two or three of those names so that people are aware um, you know, where, where the product sits and where the interest actually is. Sure, Fidelity, um, Morgan Stanley, uh, Raymond James, Schwab, et cetera. And so individuals like you and I can go on our Schwab or E-Trade account and we can purchase a capital impact note with, a, with as little as $1,000. So Ellis, as, as we wrap here, is there anything else that, that, that you would like to, to comment on or, or, or say um, about the work that you're doing? I think this work is, is incredibly important um, and my organization, my team are, are really passionate about this work. I think for organizations who were standing shoulder to shoulder with us, I think the, the time is now. I think the time is now for us to innovate and really think differently about how we think about the next 30 years in this industry. Um, the communities need it, the communities deserve it. And we have a real opportunity and it's a real moment now that we need to take advantage of. Ellis, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Tim.